Stories. What are we doing? Okay. Um, Fabio, do you want to put up uh, my presentation? Uh, yes. My name um, we might wait one or two minutes more to see oh, if okay. there's other people joining. You can okay. people as they come in. You can see the number of participants on the lower yeah. um, bottom banner of, of Zoom. Okay, so I think we can start. Are you ready so, to go? Yeah. Okay, well again, uh, my name is Michael Brady. I'm a uh, principal scientist at the Center for International Forestry uh, Research based in Bogor, Indonesia. I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, first webinar of the uh, Forest Trees and Agroforestry Program. Uh, and this webinar uh, is focused on innovations to overcome barriers to access to finance for smallholders, SMEs, and women. Uh, next slide. So the uh, CGIAR um, has several research programs. Um, this particular program focuses on forest trees and agroforestry. And it's the world's largest research for development program to enhance the role of forests, trees and agroforestry in sustainable development, food security, and to address climate change. Uh, C4 leads the FTA uh, in partnership with a, a number of other centers, including Biodiversity International, CATIA, CIRAD, ICRAF, INBAR, and TBI, or Tropenboss International. Uh, as a, uh, the FTA held a uh, science conference earlier this year in September, where we had over 500 scientists from the uh, partners, C4 and ICRAF. We had a two week event, uh, it was a, a series of open webinars, science sessions, extracting the highlights from the conference and uh, bringing them to the public. Um, this webinar is, uh, to, is the first in a series building on the uh, September Science Conference and bringing the results of that conference to the public. The aim is to inform and support concrete actions on the ground with a focus on transformative science derived from FTA's most innovative lines of research. Next slide. So the uh, innovative finance for sustainable landscapes is one of FTA's uh, 22 priorities. Uh, and it's led by Tropenboss International, uh, one of the managing uh, partners in FTA. And the, the, this priority aims to enhance smallholder market access by reduced market barriers. And the outcome, uh, the intended outcome of this priority is that financial service providers adopt innovative financing schemes for sustainable land uses and smallholder involvement. Next slide. A little, bit, uh, a little bit of background on the science conference. I mentioned earlier, uh, it had a, uh, a, what the first stream in the conference focused on inclusive value chains, finance and investment. And it was broken up into two uh, sessions on inclusive business models and value chains. And the second on reducing barriers to inclusive landscape finance. And we had a, a wide variety of uh, C4 partner scientists presenting and a number of uh, invited uh, guests and speakers. And the, the conference session identified a number of promising areas of new research uh, on innovative finance. Uh, for example, locally appropriate financial instruments 
and inclusive business models that enable scaling up of inclusive finance for sustainable landscapes. Uh, another strategy is to foster the inclusion of women in value chains and enterprise. And these research areas are uh, now being pursued by uh, C4, ICRAF and the other partners. Um, and today we'd like to, to present uh, some of these results to you and get some of your feedback. Next slide. So one of the uh, results of the innovative finance priority in FTA is a, a report on innovative finance for sustainable landscapes. Um, this report was led by uh, Tropenboss, and you'll, he you'll hear a presentation from Bas Laumann to explain the report uh, just after I speak. Uh, the publication explores the complex barriers that hinder the potential of external finance to increase sustainability of tropical landscapes and achieve positive impact at scale. Uh, it identifies some promising financial innovations, schemes, and discusses pathways to alleviate barriers. And these will be discussed uh, in this webinar. The findings result from a quite a lengthy participatory process with strong engagement from civil society and the private sector. This webinar aims to illustrate the key findings of the report and open questions that the study reveals and future areas of collaboration for implementing innovative finance. Next slide. I, I mentioned a, a, quite a, an extensive uh, engagement process that started back in mid 2018 where the uh, draft report was uh, presented at a global landscapes uh, forum finance event. Uh, and that proceeded through a, a, quite a, a large number of engagement events and opportunities through to uh, a final uh, peer review uh, mid this year. Uh, and the report has uh, just been released and you can find the report on the FTA website. Next slide. So in today's webinar, we have uh, uh, a wide number of panelists. We've got uh, three partners that will be presenting during the webinar. Uh, Evo Mulder from UNEP Finance Initiative, Jennifer Chen from Impact Investment Exchange, and Elko Bronkhorst of Financial Access. We also have uh, a number of panelists participating uh, to provide commentary. We have uh, Felix Hoogveld with Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands, Rob Busink from Ministry of Agriculture in the Netherlands. And we have uh, with us the director of FTA, uh, Vincent Gitz. And of course, I, I mentioned Baz Laumann, who has led the uh, finance initiative uh, priority in FTA and brass is with Tropenboss International. Next slide. So the program for today's webinar, um, a number of different uh, activities um, following these, these remarks, Bass will uh, present the uh, innovative finance report We'll then get some reactions and recommendations on the report by the three panelists that I mentioned. And we'll go through a polling, uh, an opportunity for all of you to, uh, to engage. And we'll ask for comments from some of the other panel members. We'll then have a question and answer session uh, with, with the audience and a panel discussion. We'll then move into the second part of the webinar, where we'll have presentations from the three panelists on their work um, and related to future collaborations with FTA to address the identified barriers. We'll then ha have another session of polling and comments, and then a question and answer period on the uh, presentations from the panelists. 
and Vincent will provide some closing remarks um, from FTA. So before I finish, just a few um, um, a few rules on the event. Um, please put your questions in the Q and A box, uh, not in the chat box. Uh, you're, you're happy to use the chat box, but we'll be looking at the Q&A box for, uh, to bring up questions for the panelists. Um, I, think, I think other rules are pretty standard that we're all familiar with using uh, Zoom over the last year. Um, we've got uh, uh, presentations are going to be managed uh, centrally, so all of the presenters, uh, please mention when you'd like your slides changed. Uh, I'll also ask all of the um, panelists to open your cameras. And with that, uh, I will be keeping time, um, but I, I wish, uh, wish all of us a, a very good webinar. Thank you. And over to Bass. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Anto, could you please show? Yes, okay. So good day to everybody. Some in the morning, some in the afternoon, some already quite late at night. I'm pleased that in spite of the short notice, uh, so many people could actually join today. And I'm even more pleased that after two years of reading, discussions and consultations, we have a tangible product that helps us, and hopefully also many of you, towards a way forward in increasing access to finance for locally controlled farm and forest producer organizations. As we went through an extensive consultation process in preparing this document, you can imagine that many people contributed in some way or other to its content. Yeah, you can see here the co-authors that contributed. But besides that, there were still many people and many, really too many to name. Yeah, uh, and also from different organizations. I want to express my gratitude to all of them. Yeah, and I hope uh, that some of them are also attending today's seminar. This document started in an effort to understand why relatively little of the international public finance flows reach sustainable landscapes and to identify whether FTA might have a role in solving that problem. Since at that time, very few documented cases had been published describing financial mechanisms that successfully had provided finance for integrated landscape management, we had to expand our work towards understanding better how finance flows to and within landscapes. And we did that with the help of eco agriculture partners and also the Dutch Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food by designing a landscape analysis methodology for financial flows. Yeah, the results of that are also partially incorporated into this document, but they are uh, available separate as well. This brought us to focus on locally controlled farm and forest producer organizations with the potential to contribute to an array of locally relevant development and conservation goals. Um, next slide, please, the slide for the introduction. Thank you. Large amount of finance already flow into landscapes. FEO in a, 200, a 2018 study mentioned that more than 380 billion US dollars already go to, flans, uh, to landscapes. But most of that is used within the international value chains to achieve value chain objectives. While of public funds, which also flow into those landscapes, yeah, uh, in reality, or, or are destined for such landscapes, in, in reality, only a small proportion reaches the field and even less of that reaches communities and local farmers on small and medium sized farms. Yeah, that want to use finance or need to use the finance to transform and upscale their practices to become more sustainable. These are the missing middle in this particular slide. The publication we're presenting here explore, explore some of the barriers to finance for this so important missing middle and that therefore hinders external finance from making greater contributions to the sustainability of tropical landscapes. 
It also discusses the way in which some forms of innovative finance may be able to overcome those barriers. Next slide, please. In this table, we can see two types of difficulties that hinder the large scale implementation of finance initiatives for sustainable and inclusive landscapes. There is the already mentioned gap between supply and demand of finance for uh, local farm and forest uh, producer organizations that need to be bridged. But there's also factors that hinder the sustainability of the practice one, of practices once they're being funded. This table summarizes the barriers that were mentioned most often in both the literature and during our interviews, the dialogue and the panel discussions. In this document, you can read more about each one of these barriers and how these are being perceived by different stakeholders. Today, we will focus in particular on the barriers mentioned in the left column of the table. And out of these, three stand out, scale, risk, and rate of return. These are considered by all stakeholders as essential barriers to be overcome, independent of whether stakeholders were involved in conventional private financial mechanisms or in innovative mechanisms, which intend to draw private capital to investments in sustainable land use practices. We will see later that current initiatives intend to address above all these three barriers, but that achieving them also depends on reducing the other barriers mentioned in this list. Particularly interesting to see was, for example, that during one of the panel discussions, both the representative of a major bank investing extensively in agriculture and that of a community business organization agreed that risk of the investment needs to be reduced, but that perceived best strategies to do so may differ quite substantially. Diversity, however, was in both cases important. In the case of the bank, diversity of finance resources, yeah, each with their own risk profiles. So blending, for example, public finance with the bank's finance or with guarantees. And diversity of activities invested in and financial, in, um, invested in and financial instruments applied to better adapt to local conditions and vulnerabilities were, was the uh, type of diversity more relevant at the local level. Next slide, please. Following the GLF finance of New York in 2018 and supported by our revision of existing documentation, we focused in this study on three relatively new financial structures. Blended finance, where public finance is used to leverage private finance to achieve specific, usually development or conservation objectives. Green bonds, where money is lent under particular conditions, usually at softer rates and longer terms than conventional loans. And crowdfunding, where private individuals or organizations provide finance for particular objectives to which they usually feel personally attached and for which, again, usually, they expect lower financial returns or other types of benefits. As you can see in this table, we looked at documented examples and tried to rate their potential to address the different barriers earlier defined. While innovative finance structures have potential to address most barriers to access to finance and sustainable implementation, you can see the yes and sometimes the yes, no answers in, in the different columns. Yeah, in practice, we have found few documented examples of how this is really done. Yeah, and a selection of those documented examples confirms that here too, yeah, for these uh, innovative financial structures, the barrier of scale remains. Yeah, they did not really, were not really able to solve them, at least not to link the large scale uh, available finance to the relatively uh, small scale um, for on the demand side. There's also a minimum interest in reducing rate of return requirements yeah, and risk management strategies that do exist have basically been designed to support the investors, but few examples recognize that also the investees or the beneficiaries have or need their own strategies to do reduce risk. For example, by being able to invest in agroforestry practices, spreading climate risks over different crops within the same farm plot. Next slide, please.
Next slide, please. Sorry, could you move to the next slide? Yes, thank you. We found that digital financial services have an enormous potential also to contribute to increasing access to finance by addressing one, physical distance, or two, like transparency of transactions of the barriers, but others need to be reduced as well through adapting financial instruments in combination with one of the mentioned innovative structures. Finance that takes a landscape approach is rare. Several cases have been documented where the local expert is a company dealing with international value change of agro-commodities seeking to achieve a sustainable resource area. While such examples are steps towards the sustainability of agro-commodity investments, they seem too focused on single commodities and may increase the dependency of local farmers, heightening their vulnerability to external shocks. In one of our landscape analysis of financial flows, for example, in Indonesia, we found that much of the private finance does address the income issue uh, for local farmers, but does not address issues of fire, food security, and availability of clean water, and in some cases may contribute to social conflicts. Other cases have been documented of private money flowing into conservation areas in order to safeguard locally relevant ecosystem services, mainly related to capture and storage of CO2 by trees. These efforts, however, may also sec have secondary effects on land uses uh, in and around conservation areas and also contribute to some of the social conflicts. Integrated landscape approaches need to start really from the landscape and not from the outside. Yeah, so making sure to identify local needs and aspirations before seeking to balance these with the objectives of national or international investors. Next slide, please. So uh, some of our recommendations are that locally constructed and locally controlled financial infrastructure can adapt financial instruments and their requirements to the local needs and conditions. Yeah, in our document, we describe an example from a, a community forest uh, association in Guatemala, which also have, has uh, a business arm, yeah, which show how they adjusted collateral requirements, adjusted interest rates and adjusted payback periods. But creating such local financial infrastructure requires time and a combination of financial structure over time. And there we describe an example of a company in Kenya, yeah, which has been using development funds to start up towards blended, uh, then went to blended finance, concessional loans and then fully commercial loans. Next slide, please. And this is the last one. Other recommendations that we make are that on the one hand, financial institutions need to become more aware of the local conditions and needs and adjust, need and adjust their instruments to meet those. But also at the same time, local farmers and SMEs need to strengthen their financial literacy in order to improve their presentation of business cases to the financial institutions. Together, they should help to increase mutual understanding of each other's business. It's also important to identify within individual landscapes which organization would be prepared to take the risk of translating internationally accepted financial structures into locally appropriate financial instruments. In Guatemala, this was done by the local community association with the help of donor funds and NGOs. Another example on a larger scale, we will later today from Indonesia, uh, presented by, I, by Jennifer Chen. Finally, it's important to better understand how risks are perceived by both investors and investees. And we're working on a number of case studies at the moment of innovative risk strategies that are being piloted. Yeah, uh, and we're working at the moment for in Ghana, in Uganda, and Indonesia. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention. Okay, well, thank you, Bas. Uh, very interesting presentation on, on the report. Well, we have uh, about 10 minutes to um, to get some reactions on, uh, on your presentation on the report, uh, any recommendations. And I'd, I'd like to ask 
the panelists to to provide comments. We, as I mentioned, we've got our three um, partner panelists uh, who were are, are, are perhaps more familiar with the report, but we have we have the other uh, panelists as well. So um, please, uh, if you've got a question or a reaction, uh, please speak up. Maybe while you're uh, while you're thinking, uh, there is a, a question. Ask the question is: um, Can you explain how standards and certification are constraining factors to sustainable practices? Yeah, this is actually it, it's a good question because um, they were designed, of course, to improve the sustainability of practices. But in our uh, yeah discussions, very often uh, where they were applied, yeah, the comment from the yeah what we call them the beneficiaries, which would be the the farm and forest uh, producer organizations. Uh, they perceived standards and certifications as an um, as a barrier in the sense that uh, for many of them it was very difficult to actually be able to meet the standards and, uh, of certification yeah so in that sense we see them as a constraining factor yeah and um it probably and, and you can see that for example in forestry within fsc yeah they uh, have been working for a long time in trying to involve more community forestry operations or smallholder groups um, in there. And they even uh, were trying to design specific standards and specific ways of evaluating the smallholders uh, when they apply their standards. Yeah, so for them, it's much harder to actually invest in the improvements that they need to make to meet those standards. So that's why we actually uh, talk about them as, as constraining factors. Okay, well, thanks, Wes. Um, again, I'll, I'll go back to uh, would any of the panelists like to uh, react to the report. Please. Uh, yeah, I don't mind to react, but I don't know, do I have to raise my hand or? No, wait? no, please, just go ahead. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you so much also, Bas, for the, the presentation. Um, if I recall well, you, you mentioned three aspects, uh, scale, risk, and rate of return. And on the, all those three aspects, I wanted to give a, a kind of a policy uh, command. On scale, uh, the question for me is, do we, do you have enough insight, knowledge now to bring um, actions to, to scale? Even it could be different approaches, different strategies in different parts of, of the world, for example. On risk, uh, the obvious question for us uh, coming from, from the ministry is always if you blend public and finance, uh, public finance and private finance, um, how do you share the risk or how do you come to a, a reasonable, a fair, uh, let's say, balance in, in what do you finance and what risk are you taking or is the other party taking? And certainly on the rate of return, um, it is maybe a, a, bit, a bit too big of a question, but uh, rates of return are, of course, important for specifically for, for uh, private lenders. But um, does this, this, let's say, this paradigm, the current paradigm, does it leave enough space for other kinds of looking at rate of return? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, Felix. Thank you for the questions. Well, actually, they, these are quite difficult to answer, of course, these, these questions. First of all, because the conditions uh, may differ uh, quite a lot between uh, uh, different countries, Yeah, but also in um, what you consider to be scale. Later today in the seminar, uh, I hope that uh, Evo will be uh, giving an example of how uh, we could get to scale. yeah. But in our case, uh, we've been looking at a little bit from a different point of view, not to, so much to, to for the, from the investor point of view, how can I invest a lot, but rather how can we get 
uh, local people together. So aggregation uh, is one way to get to scale, even though then uh, we may find it difficult to come to the uh, large scales where for uh, above all northern investors uh, are looking for. Yeah, If we talk about some funds in the Netherlands, for example, uh, that are that want to invest uh, climate finance, they look at 1 million uh, minimum or 5 million minimum, yeah, depending on the fund. Yeah, and that is um, is for local companies, it's quite a lot of, or local, com local uh, farmers and, and companies, quite a lot of money. Yeah, so um, we actually look at trying, the, at, at creating, first of all, local financial infrastructure. Yeah, you need to first bring people together at the local scale before you can start investing in there. So we think that that's where you have to start. Yeah, otherwise, and you can see that in some of the uh, new uh, financial structures at the moment, a lot of blended find in the end is going mm -hmm. still towards the companies and not to, to uh, smallholders or forest and farm producer organizations. Yeah, in terms of blending, yeah, that I think is a, is a question of negotiation. What is a fair share of risk you want to take? Yeah, but I think also here, Part of the problem is not just uh, trying to take the financial risk, but also uh, look at how we can reduce the risk or how how much risk is there really in the investments. Yeah, And part of the problem we feel with the investments is that they very often look at one crop. Yeah, You can see that in oil palm, in rubber, many of the agro commodities where investments are being made, Yeah, rather than investing in a series of crops, crops in the same area. Yeah, so that would also spread uh, the risk of investment. Yeah, um, and we're actually working at the moment with with um, with Rob Boosink on that in in Africa, looking at how we you can spread the investments over different uh, asset forms, and we also uh, are looking at agroforestry schemes. Yeah, and. Uh, see if we can show that agroforestry really is a business case. Agroforestry or mixed cropping with oil palm, agroforestry with cocoa, yeah, and then not just invest in one particular crop. Yeah, okay. and then the rate of return, yeah, we have in the documents some examples, yeah, where rate of return uh, are adjusted, that lower rates of return are requested. Yeah, but that also depends really on, this, on, the, on the risk being perceived. Okay, but thanks, Bas. Um, we've got lots of questions, uh, but we'd, we'd like to uh, just do a quick poll, <laughs> and then we'll return back to uh, more more Q and A. But uh, Fabio, if you got a, a polling question for us, yes, here it is. Okay. So this question, maybe Fabio, you can um, provide some instructions after I yeah. read it. But the, the question is, to what extent do you think that the discussed innovative finance structures, uh, green bonds, blended finance, crowdfunding, address the barriers for local farm and forest producer organizations to access finance? Uh, a number of responses, uh, partially, completely, only blended finance solves all, only green bonds solve all, crowdfunding solves all, and none at all. Uh, and please provide suggestions in the chat box if you select this last one. Uh, Fabio. Yes, yeah, so all the participants can vote. So please go ahead and vote. We'll give you a minute to think about it. And as uh, Michael said, if, um, you think that none of these mechanisms work, then we are very eager to uh, uh, hear from you what, what uh, would work or what are your ideas. So we're gonna give it another 20 seconds, I think, 20, 30 seconds. And um, thanks for sharing your, your insights.
Okay, so I'm gonna count uh, from five down. So make your choice because we're closing it. Five, four, three, two, one, and it's closed. So we're gonna show the results in a minute. Okay, here we go. That's very clear. <laughs> It looks like the, the majority um, view these structures as partially um, uh, addressing barriers to local farm and forest producer organizations. So thank you very much. I'd uh, be interested in any uh, reactions to the poll from the panelists. Um, any, was that surprising or to be expected? Um, maybe I can give some comments if that's okay. Sure, it's, uh, Jennifer. Um, yeah. So, firstly, I'm I'm very happy to be here. So, representing uh, Impact Investment Exchange, um, which is a women-owned, women-led organization, and uh, our own CEO, Professor uh, Shinaz, was the keynote speaker at the FTA conference for for two years now. So, very much, uh, she's been a champion of making finance work for underserved communities, women and the environment. So very happy to be representing IX here today. And, um, and this paper is, a, it's a wonderful way to, to set the stage for future collaborations. Um, and I think where IX can really add value is, um, again, from a, as a practitioner who, um, I guess is tasked with um, how to move beyond risks and barriers uh, to really design solutions that unlock capital for women and the environment. Um, so, you know, the, the poll I thought was, um, the, it was the exact answer I gave. So <laughs> I'm glad to see it was along with the, with the general response. Um, but I would also like to add that, um, you know, what, what I, how I, ex, you know, would look at the paper, I think uh, if you look at the risk return scale lens, we might sort of modify that a bit or, or sort of ask about how we can look at risks and barriers in terms of sort of risk return and impact. And I think this is, um, this is that other, other return that, that, um, that we were talking about earlier. Um, so I had one comment on, on the paper that I wanted to ask about, um, about risk. So one of the the paper explores three uh, different kinds of financial instruments. Um, and they're sort of through the examples that were given, there was, um, you know, yet again, a very, quite an absence of um, instruments that have uh, an explicit mandate for gender lens. And I think that's, that's just reflective of the market. So that ongoing scarcity of, of climate finance instruments with a gender lens um, really points towards a greater need for for donors to play a role in a, ca in a catalytic way. And so, um, so really for us, there are absolutely roles that, that um, de-risking layers um, where partners can come in. Um, and the trick here uh, is really to look at designing blended finance in a way where you're incentivizing behavior change. So I think that's, that's a big difference for, difference for IEX is that um, how do we look at moving forward um, actionable research where we're trying to look at how to design innovative finance um, in a way that's moving investors um, to act in a different way, where it's moving um, companies who are, who are uh, involved in harmful forest management practices to move to, and behave in a different way. Um, so this is, this is exactly the case of the the haze and, and the clean air bond that um, that you brought up in the report, which is actually what um, what IX had had developed for C4. So um, so this is uh, for uh, based on the the survey of the instruments in the landscape, the dearth of instruments for gender lens. Um, I we from our perspective, we really do think there's a there's a big role to play in terms of de-risking. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Vaz, any, would you want to respond or should we uh, collect uh, comments from other panelists? 
Yeah, well, I, I completely agree with Jennifer, uh, really. That, that's also what we saw, that, that the existing uh, examples of, of blended vines in particular, yeah, uh, we looked in, in particular at, at uh, a tropical, uh, what is it, a tropical landscape uh, finance facility. Yeah, and there really, although the intentions are very good, the practice is that it's not so different from more conventional finance. So it doesn't really change uh, behavior of, of the of the invent investors. Of course, there are impact investors, but we know they'll need to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. We need to change also the other, the behavior of the other investors. Yeah. Okay. Can I make a comment? Yes, please. Um, yeah, so I think, I, I mean, I think there's, I mean, I was one of the 83% who, who filled out partially. <laughs> um, Eva Mulder from, 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 from UNEP. Um, Eva, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, Eva Mulder, I, I lead the climate finance unit uh, in, um, in UNEP. Um, I think w one um, challenge is for, for a lot of investors and banks to, um, to finance uh, farm or producer groups who do not have a credit history or who are considered to be too risky from, say, a traditional uh, credit perspective. At the same time, I think, especially if governments uh, would come in with uh, with blended finance models, and I, I think the comments from, from Felix Hochfeld were, were quite um, uh, interesting in that respect. One, one thing that governments could think of is, is to basically ask for a percentage of, of capital to be directed to uh, farm or producer groups uh, or a percentage of capital that will ultimately benefit directly or indirectly uh, smallholder producers. Uh, so, so that could, um, how do you say, um, move away from, from financing larger clients who, who would otherwise um, probably be the main beneficiaries. Um, the other thing that is necessary, you basically need a whole infrastructure. I'm sure that uh, that Ilko will talk about some of the products that uh, Financial Access will do, but you need you need models then uh, that traditional banks are not using that are able to quantify the credit risk for 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 individual smallholders or or clusters of smallholders basically. And without that, even for impact investors, it will be difficult to to come up. And then the third element is. Um, if you work through, say, a, a company, say a palm oil company or a rubber company or otherwise, um, they will have to uh, absorb and be willing to take some of the risk if they own land to, um, to others, um, which means that the company needs to be fairly certain that those who they lend to um, are um, able to, to, to meet those commitments, basically, uh, and, and that there are clear... Uh, rules basically carrots and sticks for for failing to do that um but but the infrastructure for, for most traditional financial players i think isn't there to to reach directly to smallholders so it will have to go through microfinance institutions or or through say, lar larger companies but again i think governments can play a role um to to basically mandate that when they put contracts in place um and, and Bas, uh, if you allow me, I'm not fully agreeing with you. I mean, uh, UNEP is involved in the Tropical Landscape Finance Facility. It's, it is, a, in a way, a traditional bond. Um, at the same time, I do believe it is a, a market maker as well. It's been very difficult to get investors to buy into it. As a matter of fact, BNP Paribas had it on its books for much longer than they wanted it. Um, there were a lot of senior people in the bank that were very uncomfortable uh, with underwriting this bond. Um, and it took, it took a lot of effort to get a few impact investors to ultimately buy it. Uh, and I think failing to do that would probably have nullified any additional appetite for them to do something like this again. But you're right in that we need to strive to ultimately make sure that the and beneficiaries, say the, the, the smallholders who, who who live on the or who who work for say RU or are part of some kind of um, of plasma scheme, would ultimately benefit as well as the environment. And and I think there's a lot to win there. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that at all. And 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 of course, I don't know all the details behind the the setup of the bond. Um, we've been looking at what publicly is available. Yeah, and we also see that actually the intentions are very good, but we haven't been able to 
look at how, for example, the smallholders have been reached, which was also an intention, I think so. And they're probably still working on that. That's another thing that uh, I didn't mention, but which is part of the reason that so little is available at the moment, that though most of those schemes are relatively young. So it might be very early already to actually get uh, to see and to get the impacts also documented uh, in the field. Yeah. Bas, can I make a comment? Hi, it's Elke Bronkhorst, uh, everyone. Um, yeah, I think uh, the involvement of government obviously is, is, is really critical. And um, I think most of the, of the research and, and attention is going you know, towards uh, you know, incentive schemes for, for banks or, or other financial providers. Um, but, but there's also a very, very strong hurdle that we're seeing in, in financial regulations and, and, and capital requirements, which, which are sometimes, you know, not, <clears throat> not highlighted in, in, in the research and reports. Um, and, and especially when it comes to small finance and in particular, the longer term investment loans, which, which all tie, you know, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to sustainable landscapes, you know, replanting, rejuvenation, those types of loans are extremely unattractive for, for financial institutions to look at simply because they're multi-year and therefore the capital allocation, you know, on top of the, 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 the risks that the banks are running, the credit risks are running, you know, makes this, um, you know, an aggregate very often unattractive and, and impossible for financial institutions to go there. So I think that's an opportunity that, uh, that could be looked at. And some of these rules are dominated, you know, by international organizations like the Basel rules. Um, and, but there's also a lot that these local financial regulators can do. And, and COVID-19 is a very good example of, of how some of these, uh, these regulations can be relatively easily changed. Uh, we've seen in a number of countries in Africa financial regulators becoming extremely flexible simply because they wanted to make sure that especially for, uh, for food crops, there was sufficient capital available to, uh, of course, to, to make sure that, uh, that, the, that the planting seasons were, were um, you know, were met and that, that farmers could plant, especially um, making sure that food security wasn't threatened, you know, with, with these supply chains that, that all got, uh, got uh, disturbed. So, um, you know, when push comes to shove and, and when there's really an urgency, there, is, um, there are ways to do that. So it, it would be interesting, Bas, to, to know whether you've looked at, at financial regulations and some of the sometimes very complex underlying rules that, that, that might actually be uh, an opportunity to um, actually to look at. Uh, yes, Elko, for this particular document, actually, we did not, uh, but we're, we're now wanting to set up, um, well, we want to actually implement some of the recommendations of the report in Indonesia, and well, you'll be involved in that as well, yourself as well, but uh, there we already no noticed, for example, that uh, you cannot work just with any uh, financial organization, because of uh, regulations you know, to, to actually work with a local bank in Indonesia. Um, yeah, then it's a state bank, so that might be difficult uh, to do so with foreign money, so it needs to apply. Uh, yeah, you need to follow certain rules. Uh, there's a local uh, a credit union, but that is even more difficult to, uh, uh, yeah, because of the regulations to come in with project money. Um, so, so we are getting there. We we do for, uh, we do notice it now, but we haven't really done that an analysis in this particular document. Okay, I, I know that Steve Ifo had a uh, interesting uh, comment in the chat box on the uh, I guess the role of uh, Basel three and four on on uh, influence on banks to focus on short term lending as a capital adequacy requirements. Um, you know, complementing what uh, what Elko has, has just mentioned, Rob, did you want to say something? Yes, well, I can only echo what um, um, Ipo and Elko said. Our experience is well. We uh, to introduce myself. We're working with uh, three countries on uh, and forest farms producing organizations in Kenya, Zambia, and Ghana. And actually, we try to combine 
uh, agriculture, better agriculture practices and planting forest or maintaining forest. And we have developed uh, the business cases and we presented them to um, financial impact investors. And there was hardly any question. I think uh, I filled in in the poll that uh, those instruments didn't work at all. Also to be uh, get some discussion. Uh, I was doubting between partly and working not at all. But um, I think the problem is uh, what Bas already said in his presentation that the missing middle is a, a real challenge. Um, well, the country we're working with, they are the missing middle. They are farm, forest and farm producer organizations. And well, they don't have the credibility that the bank will, will lend them money, probably because of all kinds of rules. Uh, but also th there is a problem of financial literacy, I think. Uh, the governance is their, uh, the land, their property. Uh, what is the long term, uh, um, what is the long term uh, prospect uh, for them to make investments? And you are not sure whether the country, the land is still your own after five years. So I think on the governance level, so at, at least, uh, except, uh, especially the, the forest and farm producer organization need to professionalize. And also it's dependent on the mix of crops when you uh, produce crops uh, for the international market. So I think you should m make a difference between commercial agriculture and uh, subsistence agriculture. And especially the latter, that's even more hard to get a business case. And finally, I think when you combine uh, agriculture with planting trees, then actually uh, those farmers also produce so-called so public goods. And when there is no, say, uh, eco payment for ecosystem services, uh, then it will be even harder to, to achieve a kind of rate of return. So there are several elements, I think, that uh, hinder that those financial, innovative financial instrument doesn't work. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Bats, any uh, response, comment? Well, actually, uh, what, what can I say? I mean, we, we're trying to address most of these issues also together with Rob. So, yeah, we, we fully agree with that. And that's some of our, the big challenges we have in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've just got a, another uh, two minutes, but um, I, I think we've heard from all of the panelists. I'd like to go back to the uh, Q&A box and we were uh, speaking uh, somewhat about the role of government, public sector, and there was an interesting question uh, on a different angle uh, related to government. The question is some governments uh, with India in brackets do not make public forest extent data, uh, I guess, available and they lead their management. While plantations are private and privacy is a barrier to aggregated data. So the question is how can private climate finance address these two situations? So I guess it's, it's a lack of uh, publicly available data. Um, Bass, I don't know if you address that in, uh, in the report. Wow. No, I, I would think maybe Evo would be able to to answer that question since he's more in climate finance. We did not particularly look at climate finance nor at at that type of restrictions. Sorry, can, can you please repeat the question, Michael? I'll, I'll try okay. to do my best. It, uh, the question is: uh, Some governments do not make public forest data uh, available. Uh, and, and yet they lead their management. So I, I'm assuming the government would manage concessions and licenses. While plantations are private and privacy is a barrier to aggregated data, how can private climate finance address these two situations? So I guess it's, I guess it's the lack of access to data on, uh, in this case, forest um, concession areas? Um, I think it's a tricky question. I mean, I think it's, it's, I mean, I think the <laughs> part of the webinar, I think is around various, I mean, I see the, the lack of data as a, uh, as a barrier for 
private finance to actually come on board. Um, and this is, I think, the reason why why both uh, from governments as well as from uh, from businesses and financiers, most most climate finance is directed to renewable energy investments and energy efficiency and sustainable transport. The reason being is that there are simply more uh, comparable data. There is more transparency and in land use that is. Um, is, 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 is just much more tricky. I think there's a lot of different initiatives that are trying to address it, but um, I think it is important for government representatives who are, uh, who've dialed in that uh, I think part of creating an enabling environment is to ensure that there is good comparable data, both for public lands as well uh, as for, for private lands. Yeah. Okay. yeah maybe, I could add to, maybe I could add to that, that, that really that's one of the, uh, issues also we're trying to deal with at a landscape scale to get uh, data on forest, forest uh, and uh, both quality and quantity of forest at the landscape scale available. Yeah, so so in that sense we you could deal with that, but you need a local. Uh, well, in our case, we're working through multi-stakeholder platforms uh, supported by an NGO. Thanks, Pat. Uh, we've got lots of questions in the uh, the Q and A box. Um, I, I don't th I don't think we've got time to address them all, but I, I can see that a number of questions, uh, Bass, relate to um, micro lending, um, small informal um, enterprise, and I'm wondering. Uh, I think the, the gist of the questions are how how can uh, financing address um, those needs at the smaller scale. Yeah, well, actually, um, we specifically did not look at that um, in, in our document because we had to limit the scope a little bit. Uh, we couldn't look at everything. And really, the addressing micro enterprises yeah, depends also where you put the, the the border and where do you put the line but um, we were not looking at families for example a specific family individual families because there's a lot of um, microfinance institutions already working on that yeah and we did not think that yeah and there have been really enormous has been really enormous progress in that also um, mobile payments for example address a lot of the the problems that that they have yeah, where we saw the problem is exactly trying to to start a business or to expand a business that's already existing and to transform it into a business with sustainable practices. So we're going a little bit, yeah, a bit higher scale. Yeah, that's why we have not really addressed that in here. Okay, yeah, there's, uh, there's still a the lo lot of questions also in the chat. Um, yeah, we will uh, try and answer them also uh, written. Yeah, as far as possible. And maybe I can invite also the other panelists to do so, to look at them. Um, but also there's another question and answer session, I think after the next yeah. presentation. So, yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Bas. Um, well, well, we'll move on now to the second half of the webinar program. And this um, first activity is a series of presentations from our three panelists. And the first presentation is by Evo Mulder. Uh, can we have Evo's slides up? Okay, Evo, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Michael. Um, yeah, so what I'll uh, do in, in a nutshell is basically explain what uh, what the climate finance unit uh, in, in UNEP does and, and how it is related to, to today's topic. And um, towards the end, uh, also make a, uh, basically a pre-announcement for, for a new Jeff funded project that we will be um, executing together with uh, C4 uh, ECRAF. Um, the focus of the presentation is around creating a leaders group of uh, ambitious uh, time-bound commitments from investors, banks and businesses to move to finance uh, sustainable landscapes. Uh, next slide, please. So just very briefly, I think the case for, for sustainable land use uh, is, is something I don't have to repeat uh, for, for this uh, group. Um, but um, at, at the moment, the, the finance case is, is weak uh, for, for, for man, many reasons uh, outlined, be it um, 
risk, be it uh, the, the cost of capital and, and so forth. So, so a lot of the focus that um, my team has um, has put on is, is to create a number of blended finance solutions uh, to try and, and, and deal with this. Uh, next slide. So this is just a, a, a snapshot of, of um, how this runs, say, along the, um, the financial value chain. Um, at the moment, we can um, say that green bonds are a good and interesting solution, but uh, a tiny percentage of outstanding uh, bonds are so-called green bonds. And, and a tiny percentage of those very few green bonds are directed to sustainable land use. So I think there is a a lot of opportunity but at the moment the actual capital that institutional investors have put in that is ultimately reaching um, uh, communities uh, that is ultimately having a positive environmental social impact is very very uh, little most commercial banks still focus on trying to avoid negative impact uh, let alone um, uh, trying to, to see how to work with clients to achieve positive impact, be it from a gender perspective, be it from a, um, a climate or biodiversity perspective. We have a few examples with, with Rabobank, BNP Paribas and others, but uh, I think the, the, the challenge will be to try and scale it up. And even impact investors, uh, I mean, the name says it, um, are, are trying to focus on creating impact, but a, a tiny percentage of the amount of money that is sort of documented by the GIN, the Global International Investor Network, is directed to forestry and agriculture. So I think uh, it, it just shows the, the challenges of this uh, of this sector. And, and for government agencies, uh, especially donor governments, uh, most so-called climate finance or climate funding to date is, is focused on um, providing feed-in tariffs or, or subsidized loans to renewable energy investments. And a tiny percentage, again, is going to forestry or, or, or land use in general. This is not to say that, that climate funding for the energy transition needs to be scaled down. I think it needs to be scaled up, but the relative percentage of land use needs to be moved in line with, with the climate solution potential, in my view. Uh, next slide. So I'll, I'll basically focus briefly on two two parts. Um, the, the climate finance unit in UNEP is 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 uh, trying to actively redirect public and private capital towards um, basically positive impact uh, for um, on on land use in terms of uh, deforestation free agricultural commodity production and other forms of sustainable land use. And I think the reason why proof of concept is is needed is because there are a lot of naysayers in the world. A lot of people say, this is not doable, this isn't possible. Um, so you basically have to prove the contrary. Um, so I believe that we can only move to scale if we first uh, can create some proof of concept. Uh, can we move to the next slide? So these are like three or four initiatives that we have helped set up or, or, um, or found. Um, the left one is, is the restoration seed capital facility. It works specifically with impact investors to, to try and basically get more uh, fund managers into the space and, and make sure that they are successful in closing more deals. Then the Agri Free Fund, um, which we've set up with Rabobank, FMO, uh, Mirova, IDH, uh, the Tropical Landscape Finance Facility, and we've helped to capitalize the N Green Fund. In each of these cases, uh, at the bottom, you see the reason why we um, believe it, it was necessary for, for UNEP and my team to step in. Uh, we believe there's a need to, to basically be active in creating the market for this. Uh, increase the number of investors that are active in this space, increase the amount of capital raised, increase the number of bankable projects, uh, etc. In all of these cases, what I want to outline is that it's not for UNEP to say which projects to invest in. My, my team chiefly focuses on setting the environmental and social criteria and boundaries, um, helping to open doors to sources of concessional finance and, and basically trying to get commitments from institutional investors, um, uh, commercial banks, DFIs and, um, um, and governments. We, as UNEP, we just don't have, say, the boots on the ground. Um, so it is, um, that is really up to the banks uh, to work with their clients or, or NGO partners that we, uh, we work with. Uh, next slide. Two minutes, Evo. <laughs> okay. I'll just do this in, um, 
in, in one minute. So this, so this is the, the objective of, of the Agri-Free Fund is to unlock a billion dollars and mostly private capital. The target for the Agri-Free Fund itself is 145 million. Um, most of that money will be um, issued in the form of partial credit guarantees with a, a total estimate exposure of 300 million. And the, the private capital will then come from say Rabobank or, or other commercial banks. So that's that's sort of the model to, to basically create a double leverage. Um, and we're already at 90 million, which means to basically two thirds of the, the capital that we're aiming for. Uh, next slide. So this is the, I, I won't go into detail. This was a, an initiative we launched last uh, month, the restoration seed capital facility. It, it basically provides co-funding to fund managers who, who will try to set up uh, investment funds or close deals that have a positive impact on forest and landscape restoration. So it has, it is one of the several financial solutions that I believe are needed to, to catalyze more private investment in this space. In this case, the key barrier is that the, the challenge that fund managers are having in raising capital, first of all, and the second challenge is the fact that there's very few sort of ready-made projects that they can invest in. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, and it's preventing them to ultimately close a lot of deals. So the, the facility basically provides 50% of the cost that they need to cover. If they're successful, they'll have to pay it back. If they're not successful, it's a sunken cost, basically. Um, and then last but not least, um, so th these are all basically proof of concept uh, initiatives. If we can move to the next slide. The, the ultimate objective for, for, for UNEP, of course, is to move to scale and, and normative changes. Um, so if we move to the last slide, which I will then, then highlight. So, the Jeff is in, in the final stages of, um, of, of agreeing on a, a new project that will be jointly executed by UNEP and C4 uh, called Green Finance for Sustainable Landscapes, GF4SL. Um, and it basically has three components. Um, one is to increase the number of commitments uh, from, from financial institutions and possibly also agribusinesses. So we have a number of individual commitments but I think we need to scale that up and, and um, yeah, basically grow that tenfold. Um, and in, in a time bound uh, and, and uh, in, in, in terms of really ambitious commitments, uh, because many of the initiatives out there at the moment, in my view, are still too vague and, and too uh, voluntary. Second uh, focus will be on standardizing and framing, measuring, reporting, deforestation-free uh, commodity production. I think there's a need to harmonize how impact, positive and negative impact, um, needs to be um, uh, framed and, and, and measured, ultimately with the idea to create um, uh, market transparency and, uh, and interest from, from, say, institutional investors. And then the third component will be led by, by C4, which is focusing on community-based forest agribusiness producer groups to have access to knowledge, private investment, um, and environmentally sustainable projects through uh, learning hub, through knowledge exchange uh, products and, and, and lessons learned. So this is something that uh, I'm, I'm sure Michael can also further uh, speak to, but this is uh, an initiative that will most likely kick off in, uh, in January. Thanks for that, Michael. Over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Ivo. Um, lots of questions in the uh, Q&A box. It uh, would be great if you could uh, maybe address some of those questions in writing, and then we'll have time for, uh, for some of them to discuss orally later. OK, well, let's move on to the second presentation. This is uh, Jennifer. Um, who will talk to us about her uh, company's programs. Thank you, Jennifer. Great, all right, thank you, Michael. Um, great, so let me, uh, if you can move on to the next slide, uh, let me spend a minute to explain what IEX does. Um, and that will also help explain the, the kinds of opportunities that we see um, for collaboration. Um, so as I mentioned before, IEX is a, is a woman-led, woman-owned organization. Um, for 10 years, we've been focused on transforming financial markets so that women, uh, the environment and underserved communities um, have a voice and a value in capital markets. So we were 
established in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. So the last time the markets crashed. And this is where our CEO and founder, um, Professor Shanaz, really began to innovate a new approach to, um, to development and finance. So we continue to um, really push the boundaries of the financial system um, because of our three key commitments. And that's um, first to really be committed to um, giving women a value and a voice. Um, um, two, to be able to um, really connect the back streets to the Wall Streets. And again, this is um, sort of something that we often say at IEX because it really is about going the last mile for, um, for underserved communities. Um, and then three, really bringing all of that together. So really a lot of our work is looking at the intersection of, of women and, uh, and climate action. So to date, um, we've unlocked uh, 200 million in capital, um, empowered 80 million minds across 46 countries. Um, and we're um, moving forward in, in the new COVID era with very much a, a, a new um, lens to sustainability. So if you go on to the next slide, um, this is what I, I mentioned very briefly. Um, what's key for IEX in moving um, from research to action is really this lens that we bring to inclusive finance, and that's really the lens of risk, return, and impact. Um, so this is um, where we really look at collaboration opportunities where we can um, really bring in different stakeholders to address issues of risk, return, and impact. Um, so that we can unlock more capital. And, um, and so this is built off of a decade of, um, of our, our founders' proprietary impact assessment methodology. Um, and it really is a data-driven way to be able to change the, change the way that investors look at and assess an opportunity. So for example, instead of seeing a woman as a risky investment, um, we're actually able to show investors with data how investing in women-focused SMEs actually mitigates risk um, of the investment. So, um, so these are the kinds of um, collaborations that we're looking for where we're able to continue to innovate and, and sort of bring uh, a new um, approach to um, changing behavior in the market. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, so one area of collaboration that, that we are interested in is looking at how we are using data and information in a new way to unlock more capital for women. So women's lack of a voice in financial markets um, very much presents a barrier to progress in climate change, um, mitigation and adaptation. And we believe very strongly that without beneficiaries' voices, um, a lot of what you see in the market, um, impact fo focused investments actually do lack a lot of transparency and there's actually a very high risk of impact washing. So to give women a voice in the market, um, we really need greater efforts around being able to address the lack of technology enabled gender lens data collection methods. And so this is where it becomes critical to be able to help donors understand where the needs are from the beneficiary pers perspective. So. At IX, we're trying to address this through, again, our impact measurement approach and really bringing that onto a technology platform so that this is something that can um, help to verify impact on the ground of um, financial instruments, whether it's a, it's a climate bond or a gender bond. Um, so we are looking for collaboration around research where we can use more innovative tools for data collection and really use that data to accelerate more gender lens financial instruments. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, the second main area of collaboration that's of interest to us is around innovative finance. So really in order to um, push, uh, you know, women's empowerment in, you know, in themes where it is, it is really still absent, um, such as climate finance, donor countries really have the responsibility to move beyond traditional risk averse development tools and really to play a more cat catalytic role. So, here again, we, we, we do believe there's a, a role that donors can play on, in taking on the risk of innovation so that new solutions can be designed uh, at the intersection of gender and climate. Um, so here, um, you know, this is where uh, what IX has done around our women's livelihood bond um, is essentially a, a way in which we brought together over 20 partners from the public and private sector um, to launch 150 million debt security 
um, which is now, which was the winner of the Climate Action Award. Um, and what was critical there, again, was blended finance, where you can enable donors to come in, in this case, um, the Rockefeller Foundation and USAID, to take a role of uh, de-risking the innovative financial instrument, especially in themes and markets where there is very high risk perception associated with certain impact themes, such as uh, women or sustainable agriculture or fisheries. Um, so to date, you know, so we've been able to continue to expand the bond so that it includes more sectors um, and themes and markets. And most recently, the one closed in, in early 2020, um, expanded from three countries in Southeast Asia to include um, uh, more countries, including Indonesia, uh, and also um, Sri Lanka and, and India as well. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about the challenges of, uh, of overcoming uh, all these gaps. This is uh, this is exactly why the Women's Livelihood Bond was designed uh, to address the the missing middle. So it really is what how we sort of innovated and overcame this challenge of driving um, large scale capital to um, smaller enterprises is by pooling them together in a basket. And this combines um, MFIs with women focused enterprises who are sourcing from smallholders. Um, and this is a way to, to diversify the, the risk of the, of the portfolio. Um, and these are enterprises who are even still considered too risky for, um, for many DFIs. So, um, so even though they have good business, they have good, um, they're very strong business and they're making deep impact, they're still not being covered by, by even the, the development finance institutions. Um, it was also, a, a, in terms of the you know, the, in terms of the approach of, of always working through local instit, local financial institutions, I think this is where we would push back a little bit because when we designed the Women's Livelihood Bond, um, you know, it's so new in the instrument, in, in the market that even the bankers that we work with and we're working with Standard Chartered and ANZ and DBS, um, they themselves were not really able to understand this kind of instrument. And so we were actually told, our, our CEO was told in the first, uh, the first issuance of our bond that, um, you know, as it was going on in the market, the, the bankers were having trouble selling it to, to Asian investors because, you know, gender lens is, is definitely not an investment area that is, that is uh, hot in Asia. But the, the, you know, the bankers actually asked us to drop the name women's, uh, women's livelihood from the bond. And they said, well, if you just drop it, you'll sell it immediately. It'll be a high yield, uh, you know, emerging market bond. Um, and so that's where we really had to put our foot down, but that's really um, also the limitations of, of just working through um, financial institutions because you really have to um, be able to um, also look at how the local financial institutions will not have the foreign investors. Um, and they will also will not have the local investors. So it, it will be actually critical to look at um, these instruments that maybe they're, they're regional or maybe they're multi-sector, multi-country so that you can build the market and build the investor confidence first before you go in and, yeah. and can you start wrap working up, with local financial instruments. So, so final, the last slide. Um, so the last part of, for us really about research is again, it's, uh, it's action-oriented research. So here we are looking at um, the, the research work actually is the, the process of designing a new instrument. Um, so I've given an example here, but actually what we would love to do is to be able to work with uh, uh, Tropenbos on, on the fund that they're looking to design right now, which is to bridge financing for smallholders, SMEs, and community, communities, but essentially, but really to make sure that it is inclusive. And that means making sure there's a gender lens to it, making sure you're addressing risk um, for smallholders. So that's, um, it, you can go on to the final slide. That's really um, IEX, um, the three areas of collaboration that we see um, uh, through, the, through the paper. Well, oh, thank you very much, Jennifer. That's very interesting. And thank you for making the link to, uh, to Tropenboss and uh, FTA. Okay, our, our final presentation is from uh, Elko uh, Brockhorst of, of Financial access. Uh, Elko, please. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I've decided not to put a formal presentation together because um, there's a number of, of, of pointers that I would like to share with you. 
and, and, and where I would certainly invite your, your feedback on. I think uh, this panel provides a fantastic opportunity to talk about some, some very challenging issues um, that, that we're dealing with in the space of uh, access to finance to sustainable landscapes. And let me try to share the experience that, that we have in this with financial access. Um, the work that we do with financial access is primarily bottoms up. So we work with, with local financial institutions, with microfinance institutions in these landscapes and to really try to understand what, what their needs are and to what extent these needs could, could, be, could be met um, and, and, and combined with, with some of the solutions that impact investors are provided. Bas mentioned in this presentation basically three important hurdles to access to finance, which are scale, risk, and rate of return. Um, let me try to give you uh, some, some of our input in terms of um, these three hurdles, which, which are, are very clearly out there. There's a number of issues there that are, in our view, um, equally important. Um, let's take a look at scale. If, if you would consider that scale is a, um, is, is a key uh, hurdle for, um, for providing access to finance to smaller and small AG enterprises. That's, that's very true. But if you look at you know, where that scale could be achieved, that is primarily in the larger supply chains, in the monocrops, where obviously important concerns exist uh, in, in terms of sustainability in these, in these landscapes and whether you should support those. So there are certain ways where, where you could um, where you could achieve that scale, because scale is all about cost. And if you can find a way to, um, to not necessarily um, you know, move away from these, these larger supply chains like oil, palm or cocoa, we're doing a lot of work with rubber at the moment. And, you, and there are certain very interesting um, agroforestry models, which, um, which could actually address both. And that very often has to do with the fact uh, that the investments that are required, especially in perennial uh, replanting, would, uh, you know, would be long-term and, and banks you know, stay away from these types of investments because, of course, the, um, the, the risk-return criteria uh, are, um, are, are an important um, you know, hurdle. But at the same time, knowing that these farmers ultimately would be making more money uh, with, with better plant materials and, and with, with, with better training, but just in the first couple of years would not be able to generate that cash, would provide an opportunity for cross-cropping with some very interesting species. And we've been uh, having some, some very interesting results in Indonesia and now in Ghana with some cross-crops, uh, local food crops that would generate sufficient cash for these farmers that would allow these banks to take the risk of longer term loans, knowing that the cash is there. So um, I know that Tropenbos is also working very actively in developing these agroforestry models. And Bas, I'd be interested in, in your view if time would allow uh, during this conference to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> you also talked about risk. Um, risk is, of course, uh, the first thing that, that banks would be, would be looking at. But very often, uh, what, what holds back these, these banks to, to move into smaller finance, it's, it's not necessarily the risks that are there, but the, the risks that they perceive to be. And very often, the risks that they perceive to be very high in practice turn out to be much lower and much more acceptable if you look at the cash flow generating capacity of the ones you know, that you're going to finance. So in, in the research that we've done, we've, we've actually seen that in, in the larger supply chains, where you're looking at, at thousands of, of smaller farmers, there's a huge variation in outflows on a farmer by farmer basis than what the banks you know, perceive this to be as an, as an industrial or as a systemic risk. So if you can find a way to look at these, these large uh, groups of farmers in a much more individual way and identify you know, what, what allows these farmers to, um, to generate um, in terms of income and how they spend it would already be a very small building block towards, uh, 
towards a solution. You mentioned also the rate of return, and that's an interesting one, because uh, the rate of return obviously depends very much on on the the risk that you're that you're running commercially or on that sp uh, specific loan. But at the same time, if you're able to to bring down the costs for financial institutions to lend to these smallholders, then you'll see that that the the overall return for lending to the smallholders could be actually very very attractive. A lot of to do has to do with the fact that these smallholder lenders are badly organized, uh, have no access to, to digital technology, don't have the right skills to make the right analysis, and, and don't have the means to reach out to these widely dispersed farmers. So if you can find a way, and technology actually offers that opportunity uh, to, to, to bring down these, these costs by standardizing the processes, and by allowing these, these, these products that, that they provide to these smallholders to be standardized in a certain way, you can dramatically return those costs and therefore taking away part of that hurdle. There's actually a, a fourth element there as well, which I like to focus on, and that's product misalignment. What you see is that a lot of the, the banks, they work with standard products. <clears throat> if you then, um, invite these banks to, to look at the opportunities that, that a landscape um, investment would, um, would provide. And there you, you very often see that, that these products are not fit for the types of requirements that these farmers have. Very often there's a misalignment in cash flows and repayment periods and terms. And, and we've seen in a lot of the research and a lot of the work we do that that element has not been properly addressed and that brings me then to the next point which is co-creation if you're looking at typically how how banks are being invited or being engaged with in these programs it's at the end of the process and we've been involved in a number of programs where an investment case is being developed by an ngo or by by a number of different organizations and then at the end there is this, this, this financial need that needs to be addressed. And then they're looking out for, for a bank or for an impact investor or a combination of funding. And then once you actually come to these institutions, you say, well, this is the opportunity. Then very often this institution says, well, that doesn't really fit what we need at all because you haven't taken in, into consideration our internal processes, our internal risk policies. We talked about capital. So if we can find a way to, at a much earlier stage in these programs, partner with these institutions and, and let them become owner of the solution, um, we, we feel is a, is, a, is a much better way than to, to separate those processes out and to, to work in, in isolation. Um, I think the, the, the partnerships between the impact investors where a lot of funding is available, and very often there are international impact investors. And, and uh, Ivo just mentioned, you know, Agri3 and Green Fund, they're all doing fantastic work. But the, the monetary impact is, of course, very limited, because if you look at the capital they would have available and what's needed, it's a drop in the bucket. But if you would actually allow these types of institutions to, to develop um, a good proof of concept or a model or a, an investment mechanism that could, could easily be leveraged and where you could actually tap into the massive local liquidity pools which you see in these markets, then there is that opportunity you know, to build something meaningful that could be scaled. Because don't forget, in countries like Indonesia and Ghana and, and, and in DRC and in, in most other developing economies, the local liquidity is, is massive. Banks have, have so much cash from deposits and from savings. There's, there's pension funds and other institutional local investors that don't know what to do with, with that cash. And if you can only find a way to tap part of that and to, to structure that in such a way that it actually reaches the bottom of the, um, of the pyramid, that's already one way, uh, one way to go. Now, there's a number of other thoughts that we have, but I think I've reached the end of... of yeah. 
Thank you very much, uh, Elko. Very interesting. And I'm also interested in rubber agroforestry. So got something in common. Okay. Um, we've heard uh, three very interesting presentations from our panelists. I think to uh, just to uh, break the um, um, uh, the, the uh, cadence, uh, we've got another polling question for you, and then we'll uh, move move into some questions and answers uh, after that before we wrap up. So, uh, Fabio, can you pull up the uh, second polling question? Yes, it's up. Okay. Hopefully, you can all see the question. Um, Based on what you've heard um, so far in the webinar, what do you think is the most important next step? Uh, follow pathways of structuring and local finance infrastructure, similar to Komaza in Kenya. Design locally appropriate financial instru instruments, for example, uh, AFOCOR in Guatemala adjust blended finance mechanisms, design appropriate green bonds for landscapes, and finally, uh, none of the above. And if you choose this, uh, please try to give some suggestions in the chat box on what you think of, uh, important next steps would be. So please um, make your selection and back to you, Fabio. Yes, people are voting. We're gonna give them another 20, 30 seconds. Uh, make your choice and we're gonna close it in a moment. All right, so another five seconds to go and then we close it. Five, four, three, two, one, and we are closing the, the survey. Okay, so the results will appear in a moment. Here they are. Ah, well, that's interesting. Again, a, uh, a majority uh, selection on the design, of locally appropriate financial instruments, uh, for example, AFACOR. Aquafop. Okay, I, 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 uh, I would also agree with that. Thank you, uh, Fabio. Well, we've got um, another uh, eight minutes um, to go back to our uh, questions, answers, but I'd, I'd like to be interested to ask uh, if there are any, if any of the panelists would like to make a comment on what they've heard um, uh, in this la in the second half of the of the webinar. Um, we've had our, our three presentations, and then we've got a number of other panelists uh, with us today. Michael, if I if I could make a comment rather than a a question, sure. uh, just that especially the last part, what Il Ilko was talking about, the role of collaboration between finance and NGOs. Yeah, it, I thought it was very interesting because just this week I had a conversation with Jennifer as well, and she was saying exactly the same thing. So definitely, I think the two of you should talk. Um, but this is something that that we also find yeah, in Tropomos and that we're really looking for in some of the landscapes we work in now with with uh, with programs financed by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, yeah, um, we really are trying to approach uh, financial institutions in an early phase, but we also find it very difficult to do so because there's even like in in terms of the way we speak, there are quite a lot of differences. So probably yeah, we need intermediaries, and I, I would I'm looking now on my screen then to Ilko and, and Jennifer, because I think they are the type of, of intermediaries that, that would be able to make that step, yeah, to link NGOs to the financial, financial institutions. So I think really, yeah, any step, and, and we saw in the 
uh, the poll that uh, yeah that local financial infrastructure is is very important yeah i think if we want to get there yeah we need to collaborate we need to work together with local financial organization institution existing institution not create new ones yeah and involve organizations like uh, financial access or iix or local organizations which are similar to them yeah because um, we can't do it by themselves yeah, yeah. Thanks, um would you like to respond this, this this is something that we uh, we we indeed see a lot um and and um so much gets lost in translation indeed so um and just to give give an example and i'd, I'd be interested in in views from the floor uh, but but banks are are, are relatively you know Simple-minded animals. They they just they're 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 used to certain processes, and they're not very difficult to move away from what they're supposed to do. So, um, if if a if a bank would you know would would be um, asked to to follow the line of thought of many uh, conservation organizations or NGOs uh, doing fantastic work. They, they very often don't understand that. And, and if we can find a way to, to, to translate that work into a simple business case to start with, and ultimately to a term sheet, because that's the instruments that banks could, could work with, right? They could also go, go and do something with that and develop the steps to actually move there in a fairly structured way, which is actually not too difficult in some of these landscapes that at least uh, we've, we've worked in. That could be a very practical, uh, very practical approach. I think that that could be one. I think secondly, what you're seeing is if you, if you work in these landscapes, very often you're in very far remote provinces away from, from, you know, from the center. And, and the key decisions in a lot of these financial institutions are not made there. They're made at different levels and very often at different locations. So I think it's important to find out who are the decision makers. And you'd be surprised to see that, that many CEOs of, of even regional banks are being pushed and are being, being asked to move and do more with these smolders and, and to, to, to work with them because they do see that, that that there is a need and, and very often they, they don't know how to do that. So you just need to find the right counterpart within, within each institution to start a dialogue. And I'm sure, Ivo, you, you have some experience with that as well, but I'd be interested to, uh, to hear any, any views on that. Ivo, uh, if, you, if you want to respond. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, um... I mean, as UNEP, I've been very mindful not to sit on the seat of, uh, of, of neither a bank investor or a project developer. Um, I've seen other UN agencies uh, and international organizations actually do try to um, create business cases. And as you said earlier, Elko, those are often not aligned with what uh, an investor is asking for. So I think the co-creation element that you mentioned is, is very important. Um, and and um, I've, I've worked with a lot of financial institutions and I've worked for NGOs and, and I agree. I think there's a certain um, perhaps frustration, I think on the conservation side, but I think maybe it would help on both sides to, to learn from each other if there's more <laughs> interaction and people from conservation move into banking and vice, vice versa. Um, but but if, if NGOs want to move forward, then it, it is perhaps to, to better speak the language of, of, of financiers and um, approach projects in, indeed from, from a perspective that a bank or an investor understands. So, um, and it's, the, it's, it's not the banks or the investors who will take the uh, the, the, the initial call. Uh, it will have to come from those who are on this, uh, this, this webinar, uh, in my view. Thanks, Ivo. Well, I guess like most webinars, there's not enough time to address all of the issues. We've had a wonderful discussion. There's still many questions in the uh, Q&A box that we haven't had a chance to address. 
if I can ask the panelists to go back quickly and see if there's any uh, quick answers you can provide, that would be very helpful. But with that, I'd, I'd like to um, ask Vincent Gitz to make some concluding remarks. Uh, Vincent. Thank you, uh, Michael, and, and thank you uh, to all the, the presenters. Yes, uh, as we, as we, as Michael said uh, two months ago, we had uh, organized uh, an internal among scientists a science conference to to discuss our, our, our research and, and look at how we can link issues together and identify some of the most promising areas going forward for research and action and, and this. This seminar is the first one of a series to have a broader discussion with, in fact, with, with partners involved on the ground, uh, in the back streets very often, but also in the Wall Streets. Uh, and and uh, we call this series From Science to Action. And then because this is what we think that action should be grounded on, on solid science and, and based on evidence. But I think for this topic, as we go forward, it's also from actors to, to science as we've seen, uh, actors that are able to question uh, uh, science and and provide the experience perspectives and solutions and and the publication that Bass presented that I think is a very good example of, of of what we try to build in a participatory approach is starting from the needs of, of two very different categories of actors uh, uh, on, on the one hand smallholders on the other hand big investors how, how can we hear them or can we gather experience and, and share problems but but solutions so thanks to all of you for the time to participate in this process for the publication and thanks for for your very good inputs today also from the audience uh, we've gathered a lot of questions really thanks to all the questions very good questions and i, I think we will need to uh, to make honor to these questions and and and, and the team to answer to these provide some 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 feedback uh, perhaps on the web we can do that and, and, and share some, some, some insight. Some of the points I, I, I get from, from this very rich discussion, um, you know, not, uh, not comprehensive points, but what struck me is, yes, uh, as Felix uh, and Bas said, um, three main barriers, scale, risks, rates of returns, but let alone the question of risk, it's not, uh, the, when we look at de-risking, it's not ne necessarily only the question of is it risky, but it is what is the risk? What is the data? What is the knowledge behind? And I think here we have a lot, uh, a, a lot to, to, to share. Uh, the, the, the second point about, uh, this, what about the local infrastructures, the local financial infrastructures, uh, standardization, I think it was a, 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 a point that, uh, that was made and how to how to bring um, uh, the the um, yes the the back office the back office to 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 the Wall Street, and the last point is about scaling. Of course, there is always this issue about um, the big gap between uh, doing more, but at the same time having also more uh, or better social and environmental. Uh, consideration and what does it do to just add constraint? Is that the, the right solution? And I, I, I like the, especially evil uh, Mulder's suggestions uh, on, on these on, on these dimensions. So um, um, to, to conclude, I think it was a, a very interesting discussion. Uh, and I would like to make three points just to highlight the interest of of this series of webinars and, and perhaps invite this public also to look at the others. Uh, the first one is to, to look at um, what we do in, in, in the program as FTA in connection with this issue of, 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 of increasing uh, inclusive finance uh, from the issue of nutrition, uh, gender equity, climate change, restoration. All of this needs massive investments that will come from uh, a private sector and private money because public investment is not enough. We know that, in fact, the biggest part is going to come from uh, from, from farmers, from, from foresters. The question is how to support them and is how to attract private money towards sustainable and inclusive investments for sustainable uh, and, and inclusive landscape. The second question is uh, for us moving forward in these, in these webinars, so not just this one, but the ones that will follow is 
how how to get what is the mo where do we, where is there potential for immediate progress and i think what what we what we looked at in our conference on inclusive business model was quite interesting because there are some quick wins for instance how to improve gender equity and i think a lot can be done quickly because it's about transferring knowledge between sectors, for example, land use, forestry, agriculture, that sometimes we know well, and, and finance that are starting to understand that we need good intermediaries for that, new alliances, as was just mentioned in the discussion between local NGOs, finance, research. Uh, and, and, and last, I think we, we have an issue of urgency here uh, uh, with these opportunities. Uh, there are small holders, small enterprises even more now is with, with, with in the in the in the current uh, economic context has been disrupted that deeply need finance and funds to invest they need to transform at the same time the activity to make it more sustainable economically socially environmentally and at the same time as we've seen and Elko Broncos has said there are plenty of money looking for investments uh, so how can we reach uh, the bottom of the pyramid, as you said, Erko, or, 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 or the back streets. Now there is an opportunity, I think, to, to find ways to build, to bridge the two in, in order to, 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 to build back better. And I think one of the points that we've been looking at is also how we can use jurisdictions, because one, one other actor very often in landscapes are the local actors, the local jurisdictions that pursue sometimes the same goals as, 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 as finance, private finance and private um, foresters and, and, and farmers to make their landscapes, jurisdictions attractive and sustainable. Thanks, thanks to all the organizers and thanks to the presenters uh, for, for their time and the rich discussion. Uh, over to Thank you, you very uh, much. Michael. Thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, very interesting uh, summary and synthesis. Well, that, that concludes our webinar. Uh, again, this is the first in a series. Please check with the FTA website. Uh, this, uh, the materials from this webinar uh, should be posted on the website and you'll also find information on upcoming webinars. So I, I think our time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, all of our presenters, panelists and uh, participants. Thank you. Have a good day, a good evening. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Thank you.